Welcome back to GCTV. Welcome back to sunny Mexico. It has been a beautiful afternoon thus far. You can see the crowd behind me on both sides here starting to build as we get deeper and deeper into the day here in Global Champions League. There is still the second round to come, but what an entertaining opening round and what a fairy tale story for Fernando Martinez Soma, a homeboy here in Mexico for the Prague Lions going on to jump clear. And let's take nothing away from his teammate, from his partner, Thibaut Spitz. He was sensational, the young man, on that nine-year-old in Miami. Well, guess what? He brings Impress K to Mexico. He jumps on a completely different surface and delivers a clear in a time so quick that it knocks the Rome Gladiators into second place. And now, can stars move down to third? Let's show you what the rankings look like and give you a better, bigger picture of how the teams stand at the end of Global Champions League round one. As we said, Prague Lions, boy, they were sensational just less than a second and a half faster than the Rome Gladiators and Cannes Stars. And then a handful of teams on four. Falcons Wart United take nothing away from them. Jack Ryan and Jill Thomas, two very young riders, keeping the team on a very good score. Scandinavian Vikings and Istanbul Warriors, I'm afraid, on 16, having a pretty tough day. And I'm afraid there were still some pretty high scores as well that followed for New York Empire as a few other teams really struggled. Rieserbach International, we spoke about them a lot in the pre-studio. How were they going to survive with a few changes, a few new look faces? And I'm afraid for the team powered by Kingsland, we had four penalties for Richard Vogel and eight penalties for Philip Schulz at top off. Rieserbach Internationals now find themselves on a combined score of 12 penalties. We we'll get to the leading team in a few moments' time. We want to find out what they have to say. We want to go back and re-watch those moments as well. Just give you an idea just as to how the Prague Lions, powered by the Czech equestrian team, were able to put themselves into first place. We also have Frederick Tabaka standing by a little bit later on. Get some analysis from him. Get an idea as to how round one played out. He gave us a few pointers earlier on. Let's see if they held up. Let's take a look at the Prague Lions round. This is the highlights of how the Prague Lions were able to get into first place at the halfway stage.
Thibaut Spitz and the hometown hero Fernando Martinez Soma leading the Prague Lions powered by the Czech equestrian team into provisional pole position. They will be the very last team to go in Global Champions League round two. And can we see yet another sensational performance from them like we saw at the end of the previous stage in Miami? Now, Frederick de Buck is standing by for us to give us some reaction on what has taken place. And can I start by saying, Frederick, two of your favorites find themselves inside the top three you got to keep up this good streak, my friend. I'm really sorry, Mark. I've got loud Mexicans in my ear. I just, um, I didn't hear your question. I'm sorry. I was complimenting your wonderful predictions that two of the top three were in your favorites. Oh dear, all right. We seem to have some difficulty with Freddy Tabaka. We'll see if we can try and get him back onto the show uh, as we reconnect with him. Yeah. We are trying to see. If I, I was get saying all the time, what I was a loud Mexican Spanish guy in my ear. I don't hear him, anything. He put out a couple of favorites, and two out of the three, in fact, have gone on to find themselves on, on Frederick's favorites list. So he's done pretty well. We'll uh, see if we can take a break and we'll try and get Freddy Tabaka back onto the show. This is GCTV. This is the halfway point of Global Champions League Day. Welcome back to GCTV here in Mexico City. If you've just joined us, the Prague Lions, powered by the Czech equestrian team, find themselves in the leading position ahead of the Rome Gladiators, the only two teams on double clear, and then the Cunt Stars, your joint GCL leaders, find themselves in third place on a score of four penalties, a wonderful clear from Sana Tesa. Some difficulties for the Rizemak international team, powered by Kingsland. They came here this weekend under some special technicalities of Rule 2.0, Five that allowed Richard Vogel to come and support the team because of the injury to Owen McMahon. A lot of talk around their performances. Philip Schulz, a top off, and Vogel. Eight penalties and four penalties, respectively. They find themselves on 12. We caught up with Philip Schulz, a top off. Philip, it's a slight improvement on Miami, but it's still not double clears. What do you think went wrong in, wrong in there? Uh, yes, I agree. It's an, a little improvement, but. Uh... We are for sure not happy about this performance. Um, we had a little, little more hope, to be honest. Um, yeah, we have to look for the second round and, and try to do it better. I saw you guys chatting after the round. Were you talking about your round's tactics for round two? Uh, tactics is really simple. We have to go clear. <laughs> that's that's uh, 
yeah, as I said, really simple. Um, yeah, we, we did a, a short analysis, but uh, yeah, we have to look forward for the second round. We can often see you coming back here in Mexico City from Miami. Do you believe in round two that you can make that happen? Um, yeah, we have to <laughs> we have to stay focused and look forward. It's, it's, it doesn't help us to to look back and and to see only the faults and and to be disappointed. Uh, we have to to yeah, to look forward and then uh, try to make it better. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Still somewhat of a smile on the face of young Philip Schulze Topov, but you would get the impression that on 12 penalties that Rieseback International may not play any part in a podium a little bit later on this afternoon. But stranger things have happened in the world of show jumping. Many would feel, though, that between those two teams on double clear, your leaders, the Prague Lions and the Rome Gladiators, powered by ClipMyHorse.tv, that surely out of those two in good form, they might be your winner for Mexico City by the end of the night. Speaking of people in good form. Well, Michael Duffy, if you recall, granted we jumped platforms to the LGCT. We had him in studio last week as the winner of the Longines Global Champions Tour Grand Prix of Miami Beach, and he's continued with that form into the Global Champions League, jumping clear here today along with his teammate Lorenzo De Luca. We caught up with Michael Duffy. Michael, a fantastic start for the Rome Gladiators there. You and Lorenzo must be so pleased. Yeah, um... Very happy, um, but the boat jumped very good, and it's tough enough jumping in there now, I must say, it's, it's big enough, so, yeah, it's a good, good, good start. We're not seeing very many clears in there. Is it the way the course is? Is it the arena? What do you think it is? I'm sure, a bit of everything, but it's, it's, it's bloody big now, you know what I mean? It's, it's big enough. It's very fair, there's not, there's not too many casualties or anything, but it's, um, there's enough for jumping to be done anyway, that's for sure. Going into round two then, you've got the, the, we call them the big boys coming in, the next horses coming. Great team tactics there. Well, sure, we don't know yet. We'll have to see now after the second round, but um, the first part of the plan is, has, has gone correctly anyway, so good start. Good start. Good luck for the next. Cheers. Thank you. Michael Duffy from the Rome Gladiators along with Lorenzo De Luca find themselves in second place. The Cunt Stars, as we said, powered by Iron Dames, currently in third place. A wonderful clear from Sanatesa. Katrin Ackerman a little bit earlier on, just before that, on Shao Li, having one rail down for four penalties. So as it stands, Prague Lions, Rome Gladiators and the Cunt Stars in first, second and third. Now the course will be rebuilt. There will be a new course walk and there will be an opportunity for us to prepare and preview Global Champions League Round 2. That is still to come later on this afternoon. So stay with us here on GCTV. More from Mexico City next. And finally, this year in 2024, the Global Champions League enters its eighth season. It's a team championship over 15 stages, with riders of different nationalities competing on each team. Every team has a team manager who selects a maximum of six riders for the season, and they must contain at least one under 25. Halfway through the season, the transfer window allows the team's manager to change riders on their roster. This year, the transfer window opens after Paris and closes before stage nine in Stockholm. A maximum of three riders travel with each team to each stage, but only two of them can compete at the two rounds of GCL. Between rounds, a manager can swap in a horse or change rider. The penalties of both riders are added over the two rounds, meaning there's no drop score. In case of a tie on points, the added times from round two will be the tiebreaker. The team that wins the stage will add 30 championship points to its tally. Teams are battling to finish in the top four in the championship as that takes them straight to the semi-finals of the Global Champions Playoffs this year held in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And the team with the most points at the end of the season will be crowned 2024 Global Champions League winners. My name is Gregor Lixen. I'm the team owner of the Scandinavian Vikings. 
job is to get all the sponsors together so we can finance the team. And then I get the riders together, which I think will do good for the team. The third thing I have to do is to put the riders for each show together to do the job, you know, to make as much points as we can to get to the final. My main thing is that the sponsors are very happy and they enjoy themselves at the show. They don't feel alone at the show. So it's important that we talk to them, inform them about what's going on, etc., etc. It's my job to decide who rides on the team class. When we finish the first day of the team, we talked through it, what happened and what was our plan for the second leg, because that's important that I get the feedback from the riders so I know which horse is the best for the day. What I like most about my job is that I can go to these fantastic shows and get a good team together and run it. That's very interesting, I find. My name is Kristina Ribicic and I'm the groom of Jody Hall McAteer. My job consists of making sure that the horses are at their best to perform at this level. First of all, there's a lot of traveling involved and you're traveling everywhere with your horses. The main challenges of grooming would be making sure you're on time, making sure you're organized. In the mornings, I give my horses hay, give them hard feed, make sure they have plenty of fresh water, muck them out, check their legs and their whole body. The busiest part of the day at the show would be preparing the horse for the competition. We spend 24 hours with the horses and we do everything for the horses and for the rider. It's very important to give the right love to the horses and the right care. I just love my horses. They're like my babies. My name is Rob Hoekstra. I'm the team manager and coach of the Paris Panthers. Uh, the coaching aspect is preparing the horses in the warm-up and the riders in the warm-up, walking the course, planning a strategy and to see what the riders have done. Normally the first day we try and go for clear rounds, this time it's not that important. Second day depends on what the other riders have done, the other teams have done, and then we make a plan for that. The role I have mainly is to be able to discuss with the riders, all these guys are already top riders. Discussion is always good to make sure that the plan we've made suits their horse. I think it gives them confidence and confidence is everything in riding. Obviously the busiest part is the team classes, the first team class and then the second team classes and then I always help them for the Grand Prix. So the most challenging part is jumping clear rounds. Well the main goal is obviously to jump clear rounds and to try and win as many team classes as we can. The best part is to work with top riders. All our riders in the team are in the top of the world and to be able to work with top riders like that is very very nice. These are some of the hardest shows in the world. Competing against uh, top of the world. Each team is required to have one under 25 rider. If you're good enough, you make it. And if not, then it's a little difficult. It's not like a car. When it's broken, you bring it to the garage and it's fixed. It's my special horse. Yeah, there it is. He changed my life. What a start from the championship. It's overwhelming. It's a dream come true for me to be here. The score now rises. I'm stressed. You can be on top of the world the one week and then at the bottom of the pile the next week. Ooh, and it comes to a stop. Jumping good as well. They always say you're as good as your last round. Show jumping is down to the finest details. Not trying to be fifth, just trying to be first. Look at that! Unbelievable! That one will be hard to beat. Some of these under 25 riders will be the champions of tomorrow. This feeling is... I'm here to win and not just take part. Coffee is a big part of my morning. And then normally I head to the show. I'll flat ride the horses. They are normally exercised early in the morning as well. And then I head back to the hotel. I like to go to the gym, make sure I'm in good shape. You know, I put so much work into my horses. So it's important I look after myself as well to keep up with all the big guys, basically. I really enjoy running. Sometimes if I'm in the cities, I'll go for a little run, do a lot of core work with the riding, the core stability in the saddle is very important. 
I'm so fortunate I get to do this. I'm living my dream. It can be quite overwhelming jumping at this level against my idols, some of the best riders in the world. So I just want to make sure that I enjoy it and don't get so caught up and fixated on the result side of things. Because of that, I've been working with Poppy Blanford, a mental coach. I normally would speak to her before a show, especially the important events like London. I've been aiming for this for a long time now, my home show. I wanted to be here in good shape. It's been important working with her to kind of create the right mental process to create consistency jumping at this level. I never skip breakfast. It sets me up for the rest of the day. I love a good English breakfast. It's my favorite thing, but obviously it's quite heavy to have every day. So I normally have an omelet, some kind of egg, some yogurt or something like that. I've been living in Holland for a year and a half now, so it's not so often I get to come home. It's very nice to be back here and to see a lot of people that I haven't seen for a while. My younger sister Ellie is competing here this week, so I'll be coming back to the show and watching her and supporting her in the two star classes. We've both grown up around it. As a family, it's really special to have that involvement together and the understanding there and the support from my family is everything everything to me. I'm very fortunate to have some fantastic sponsors. So this morning I'm doing some promotional filming with Lemu. I'm debuting a new show jacket with them. When I'm at shows like this, it's very important to interact with them and get some content for them. I've been training with Ben Schroeder for a year and a half now. Ben will be on the ground whenever I'm on the horse, really, feeding back to me, giving me little tips, keeping me in check, making sure I'm 100% on the job. Then we'll walk the course together go through, make a plan. We'll watch the riders go, see how the course is riding and keep feeding back to what I'm going to do. Before the class, I like to go back to the stables, kind of check the horses, make sure everything's in order, that my groom Tina is also there and knows what's coming and what's next kind of for the day. Make sure my horses are happy as well. And normally I like to give them a treat before the class, kind of motivate them that they'll get more later if we do well. With Poppy's help, I've kind of created a process whereby I'm always feeding back to my riding and what's going on with the horse. I call it my Bible. It's a journal and basically any um, time I've made a mistake, I kind of look back at what the thoughts were and how I reacted to certain mistakes so that moving forwards, if ever I'm in that situation again, I know what to do and what can do better. When I go in the ring, there's 45 seconds when the bell's gone, kind of regroup and get in the zone and get the job done. So after the class, I head back to the stables, I take my boots off, normally say thank you to my horse and thank you to Tina as well for looking after the horse and me and keeping us on the road really and then I head back to my trainer we have a debrief watch my rounds back and analyze what went well and what could have gone better to have my family watching me in real life is very special. My grandparents, they watch everything on the live stream. Uh, they've given me every opportunity possible to do what I do today and they've made my dreams come true. So I'm so thankful for, to have them here watching me and to share the highs and the lows of the sport with them. Geordie Hall McAteer jumping a double clear and with that brings the team one step closer to their first podium finish this season today are incredible. They're something I've dreamed about since I was very small, so I just want to make the most of it. I'm very thankful to be a part of it and to be in the position I'm in. I just want to keep moving forwards as a rider and I hope for many more days like this in the future. Innovation for me comes as part of my work as being a rider and a competition rider and horseman. When you're on a certain level and you want to become better, obviously you cannot do the same 
and then you have to develop new things and try new things and you have to be brave and you have to accept maybe you try 10 things none of them might work but if one is working it's going to be worth it because then you're going to take one little step forward that has driven me to develop new things Peter Fredriksson, and this is Pursuit of Greatness. To invent new things, you have to have knowledge. It's not enough just to say, I would like to do a, something new. If you don't have the background and the experience, I'm actually not only for new things, you know, I'm really respecting traditions. You know, a long time ago, I read Alois Podaitsky's book, The Horse and Rider from the Spanish Riding Schools. I read three times and you can learn so much from it. I realized that the better the horses feel, um, the happier they are, the better they will perform. So I've made some changes during the years for two reasons. One is because I like the horses, I don't want them to have a good life. But and the second reason is because I want success. He's very driven of searching for development. Maybe the last five, seven years has been much more of it. Because I think uh, together with the confidence that you maybe believe more and more and more that you don't need to do like everyone else. Maybe you should do your own way of taking things. The first idea is that I did was um, at the Olympics in Barcelona when I rode Hilly Trip. Jan Jönsson, my trainer, told me that I should run the roads and tracks instead of riding on her just to save her for the cross country. And the boots I had were really uncomfortable to run in. So I went to a, a cobbler and I took my trainers and I said, I would like you to make me a pair of riding boots that feels like these trainers. And I would like to have them really light because I have a small horse. I'm a big guy and three-day venting is a lot of effort for the horse. He is a couple of steps ahead of, of the rest of us. <laughs> so so he, he, he was already then, you know, seeing things uh, that we hadn't seen. He saw the problem and he made a change to it that he really benefited from. My wife, Stina, from the beginning, she thought that Peter was a dreaming artist type. She said, Frederick, Peter is almost like a copy of you now. He's just working in the future with new ideas and development. My father is now running a project called the Brussels Project. That's something actually I had for, for many, many years. This is the project he has with a uh, the way you bring up horses in a natural way to make them actually better prepared for the life as a sporting horse. When we buy a horse, we don't check if it's been standing inside in a small pen or if it's been outside, you know, training the ligaments and the hooves and all these things. In the future, we're going to be more interesting in these aspects because for sure this has a huge influence on the horse's potential as a sport horse and for the length of the career. My father uh, is a professor and, and he has been worked with developing things his whole life. He always lives 20 years ahead. He say things and uh, people say no, no, but it always end up there. My father's mindset, I really appreciate it. He's very open-minded, he's very curious. He's not stuck in any way that this is how it has to be. He has a passion for what he's doing. He gave that spirit to me, my brother, which I'm very grateful for. But this barefoot thing I tried actually start with a horse called Hanson. He got his injury and we just couldn't get him back. So we took the shoes off. For some reason I just thought, I'm just gonna see how he moves without the shoes. Within a few days, it was a big improvement. And he got a second career. After that, I thought, okay, why just do it on horses that are lame? Maybe we should not wait until they get lame. I just kept all my horses barefoot and, and that's where we are now. 
His innovations uh, can, I mean, it can be small, it can be big, and it's, uh, it's surprising. And, and uh, sometimes uh, we get like frustrated because we already started working like in a specific way maybe, and then it comes with the new things. If you're gonna work here, you have to get used to it and just get along with it. I have uh, noticed by myself that uh, I look on the hose in a whole different way than I did before. Or I always uh, have an extra eye on the hooves and uh, if I need to rasp it or I look on the frog if it's healthy and uh, if it needs some extra care I always put it on. We always need to uh, think uh, how the ground is before we, uh, for example, unload our horses. When we did this, we had to learn everything. Try it out, see what is working, what is not working. Pieta was trying to get it with us as best as possible, and this we are still doing. Because it's still so much you can learn from everything, and that's so nice to work with him, because he really tries all the time to improve everything. And then I mean really everything. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's amazing. It's really fun. The knowledge about hoof is mainly for the farriers. I didn't have any knowledge about to work with hooves. That's why I'm starting this research project now together with Agria and uh, vets and researchers and very good farriers. He's always willing to share what he knows, but in the same way he um, he's always very you know strict in the way he's not saying that what he knows is the rule. He's very open-minded, and I think he really enjoys the discussion itself, because it often leads to something. We discuss innovation a lot together. We both are um, really uh, trying to find always something that we can improve and do better, especially for the horses. How can they feel even better? We both believe is we can only do this in the best way with a healthy uh, horse in both ways, not only physically, but especially mentally. And then the Olympic Games that came up and I was very close on putting the shoes on because I knew I had all in was for a good horse. And I didn't want to experiment on the Olympic Games. So I was really, yeah. should I go barefoot or should I put back the shoes? But then he'd been going really good with no shoes. At the Tokyo Olympics, we both, of course, had two horses barefoot. And uh, it was interesting, me and Peter, we were going around in the stable and trying to do that last millimeter because we believe so much in details. The barefoot for sure helped us to get the gold. To see uh, Peter and Henrik at the Olympics in Tokyo riding barefoot made a big difference for me. Uh, I really tried it myself. Uh, before I just did it on young horses. The biggest positive changes uh, I've seen on my horses is uh, actually the soundness. The horses get more sound and less injuries. But after that I decided I try it on all my horses, even a little bit older and better ones. If you go uh, 10, 15, 20 years, into the future, for sure, we will look back and see Peter as one of them who changed a little bit the view on, on what we're doing and how we're doing it and uh, makes us question more why we're doing things, can we do it better? Uh, not, not just we do it because we've always done that, but to widen our perspective a little bit, I think for sure he will be remembered as one of these riders. It's like a new era a little bit that the rider starts to be interesting in the feet of the horse and how that actually affects the horse and the performance. This is not a, like a barefoot movement I'm doing. There's really um, uh, missing products on the market. There's some products like for um, rehabilitation or for hoof diseases and so on, but I'm looking at if we could find a better solution that could make the hoof work in the best possible way, but we still can protect it so we can use it on different grounds, we can ride on grass and you know, just to find the solution that are, have the best from the both worlds, the best from the barefoot and the best from the shoes.
it's an area of, which is very close to what Booth wants to be about. It's this philosophy of putting the horse at the center and really doing what's best for the horse in, in any given situation. Booth is trying to provide and to develop a range of products that will help with hoof protection without having to all the time um, have iron shoes on them. Another area is what we call equipment. You know, every day I ride, I think, if we just could make these small changes, you know, because it hurts a little bit here or it doesn't really fit here or I would like to change things. So that's what we're doing now. We try to make collaboration with these companies I already work with, that we make these changes on the products that is already best in the market. We would just make them all a little bit better and make an online and make sure they are fitting and looking good together. They should be comfortable for the horse, comfortable for the rider. One of the projects we had is the helmet for Pele, because he had a helmet that was kind of not fitting so well on his head or kind of slipping down a little bit. So he has been working with that, that it's comfortable and that it fits right and that he, he doesn't have to change it when he's riding. And uh, Pedro is very innovative in everything. He goes his own way and he doesn't care what others say. He has a lot of skills and uh, knows what he wants. One of the things that is closest to our heart is the building of, of what we call the Booth community. Pedro is just such an inspirational and good person to be able to do this because he has been um, riding at the top sport level and yet he always has the time and the energy to think about what's best for his horses. A lot of the time the rider has to look at horses, they have to run the stable, they have to get the money and has to compete every week. When the day is over, normally there's no room for thinking about new ideas and work with companies like top riders, they have the days full anyway. That could be a reason that uh, development is going quite slow. And uh, this leaves a sport that is, there's really room for improvement in the question of sport, I think. I want to, this company I created, want to be just pushing forward the development a little bit. That's why we have to start with the knowledge, just to research, learn more, be curious. And the next step, invent new things, you know, just pushing it forward a little bit. And I think it's a great time for me to do it while I'm in the sport because I can try the things and I want these things to be used by people in the sport that want to become better. The horse and rider has to be as one to be able to perform really well. The love of the horse is the most characteristic he has. He could have been a horse in a former life. He just puts his hand on a horse and it gets calm. He really expressed to me pure talent. The most valuable thing was actually to watch him because yeah, you could see that he was doing it with such a feeling. The rider has to shape the horse and make it into a, a star. Welcome back to Mexico City and welcome back to GCTV. My name is Mark Lewis and as you can see behind me, there is so much activity happening behind us and we're going to find out what it is all about. In fact, let me just step aside maybe even just to give you a better idea as to what is happening there. There is an incredible presentation 
an exhibition that is taking place here. And we've sent Rosie Tapner into the arena. She's going to give us some details. If you have just joined us, the Prague Lions, powered by the Czech equestrian team, lead at the end of Global Champions League round one. There were only two double clears, them and the Rome Gladiators, powered by ClipMyHorse.tv. And the Kun Stars, who won in Doha, performed well in Miami, and now look to try and come again strong here in Mexico City. They are really knocking on the door. Are they a true championship contender by the time we get to the end of the season? It looks like they have the credentials, they have the horsepower, they have the rider experience because they are jumping superbly well. We will take you through the start list as to how round two is going to play out, and we'll get some reactions to what Peter Grant has put together for Global Champions League round two. But before we get into all of that. Let's lighten the mood. This is Mexico City. Let's go to Rosie Tapner inside the ring because I want to understand, Rosie, what on earth is happening behind me and what is going on here inside the ring. The atmosphere is electric down here. It's just slightly calmed down for a minute, but we've had drums, we've had really loud music. Now, what you're witnessing here is the Pure Peche. Now, it's the term used for a monumental cultural display of which we are seeing lots here. Behind me, you can see the dance of the little old men, which is one of the dances of the city of Morelia. And over here, look at this stunning display as well. I tell you what, it's quite a different course walk to some of these riders having this exhibition going on behind them. This is really bringing together the arts, the architecture and the music and it's all now part of the world heritage and it's here today to exhibit the modern and the innovative city that Morelia is today and we are so lucky to be witnessing it. The crowds are huge all around here to witness this today. We've got the little devils, we've got clowns and so much more. What a spectacle that we are lucky enough to see here in Mexico City, really bringing the culture here to the show jumping. I love that, Rosie. I really do. What an exhibition here in Mexico City to be able to see the combining of all of those fields come together. I really, really like that. So, Rosie Tapner, thank you very much. We'll find out more about that, of course, throughout the rest of the afternoon, I have no doubt. But for now, we start focusing on the sport. We start focusing on the teams that are now in the position going into GCL Round 2. This is what a virtual ranking will look like. So, just to remind you, if we were to end Global Champions League right now with well, the Prague Lions in first place, Rome Gladiators in second and Cannes Stars in third. This is what it would look like. On the right-hand side, stage points. Prague Lions would win the stage and take home 30. Rome 25, Cannes 21, etc. Adding it to their current existing score would take the Cannes Stars to 65, the Rome Gladiators to 69, and the Prague Lions, if they were to hold on to their lead here today, will become the new official leaders of Global Champions League for the 2024 season. Take nothing away as well from the Mexico Amigos punching well above their weight, now currently in fourth place as far as our virtual standings are concerned. Stockholm Hearts, though our Falcons and Falcons Wart United would make up positions five, six and seven. That is the virtual ranking of Global Champions League if it were to end right now. Of course, that's not the case as we see Rizemak International still continuing to struggle in eighth place and the Shanghai Swans, so many people's pre-season favorites, find themselves in 12th place if they were to go on and finish where they are now. That's the virtual rankings as our wonderful Mexican exhibition really starts to pick up now. It is wonderful to see what's going on, the color, the energy, the excitement. We'll put that on a side for now because I want to talk about the sport. I want to talk about the action. And Frederick Tabaka is standing by for us. Frederick Tabaka, this has been a really intriguing Global Champions League round one. Take us through the changes that we can see for the second round coming up. I'm sorry, Mark. Can you say that once more? I said, would you mind taking us through the changes that we can expect for Global Champions League round two, the changes? Sorry, Mark. Thank you very much. Well, we've got actually three teams that didn't make any changes at all. Um, those are Prague Lions, the uh, team that leads at the moment. They stay with the same horses, but also with the same riders. Obviously, they don't have any third rider here, but they stay with Lady and with Impress Kavan Katon. Hey, to be fair, I did think 
that um, Fernando Martinez Sommer would have brought in Lady van der Haarterhoeve. Um, who else did make any horse changes? That's somewhat surprising. No Edwina tops Alexander on Valkenswaard United. It is Huppie VDL with Jack Ryan and Luna van der Denhoff with uh, Gilles Thomas. And the other team that doesn't make any horse changes. We knew that already before the start of this Global Champions League. Well, actually, Stockholm Hearts powered by HM. We love horses. They uh, stay with HM Indiana and with HM Luna van het Ruitershof uh, Z. However, Riesemek International, Richard Vogel, he changes to uh, Sepano Balube. So, other than those three teams that I mentioned, Valkeswaard as well as, uh, what did I say, Stockholm and uh, Prague Line. All the other teams do make horse or rider changes, Mark. Right, thank you very much. Frederick, I know that this is a very unique course walk that's happening behind us with so much excitement and entertainment inside the ring. Are you able to tell us anything about GCL round two from the course that Peter Grant has put together just yet? Well, Mark, because you ask so nicely, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about that course that is uh, built by uh, by Peter Grant. We've got it right here on um, on our desk, and Peter Grant has come up with a course that is much more technical, uh, much bigger also than what he has built for us already in uh, the first um, round of GCL. Um, what do you need to know about this course, Mark? Well, you need to know that actually. There's nearly no straight line. The only straight line in this entire course is only from fence 10 to fence 11. All the rest is on the band. Now, keep in mind that everything is at meter 60, some even just higher or wider than um, meter 60. So everything is on the band. So Peter Grant has really made this um, a balancing act. Two to three, serpentine. Four, five, six, serpentine. Seven, eight, nine, serpentine. And then here, the only straight line, because also the, the last line is actually on a bend. So Peter Grant, along with the natural undulation of uh, the arena, also plays with the balance of those horses in this very, very big track. What do I want to talk about? I want to talk about the line seven into eight and here into nine. It is all on related distances and all on that serpent and on that curved line that we spoke of. In the line from seven to eight, there's an option. Normally, it is seven strides. However, seven strides is actually if you take the bend, but if you don't take the bend and you jump it a little bit more on the inside, then you can do it on six strides. And the same option he actually gives you in the next line. Peter Grant, if you stay inside of the center line that he has built here, you can get there on eight. Otherwise, it will be nine on the, the outside. So that is one of those technical lines that he has uh, put up just to test the balance and to test the approach of the riders. Which plan do you come up with in uh, the center of that course? But I also want to talk to you about the last line. And look how late this triple combination comes up. He's got 13 fences, and the triple combination is 12 A, B, and C. So in the first part of that uh, combination, it is actually quite short in the two strides. Sorry, that is in Dutch. It's short in here and it's long in here. He's given them 11 meters 30 in this part and 8 meters 40 in here. And then a very, very committed seven strides. You first have to jump those two verticals and then you have to commit on those seven strides and really ride them with uh, a lot of uh, power. First jump the vertical and then get there on the seven strides. If you're a little bit late with your reaction mark, you uh, will get way too long to that final oxer. And just to give you an idea, that final oxer is 1.65 meters wide. So that is a huge test. There's balance, there's undulation, there's some options. But the main part, the biggest challenge, sits at the end of that course with a meter 65 oxer coming into the combination, then a long and a short distance coming out, and then another meter 65 oxer right at the end. You do need a lot of power in the second round of Global Champions League.
Frederick De Bocca, thank you very much. That is Peter Grant pulling out all of the stops here today for Global Champions League round two. And as Frederick pointed out, the close of that competition. To have those questions being asked so late in the round, that is going to be incredibly challenging for the world's best riders coming up for Global Champions League round two. One of the big talking points as well is the fact that Muda Ziada comes in for the Mexico Amigos. And as expected, he goes on to jump if looks could kill. Has been in outstanding form alongside if looks can kill over recent weeks. In fact, three out of four clears is what the stat is for him this season. So he is right up there with the Christian Kukuks and obviously with the lowest penalty per round rate for the Mexico Amigos this season. We caught up with Muda Ziada, who comes in for the Mexico Amigos. I'm Muda Ziada. I'm an Egyptian uh, rider. And this is uh, If Looks Could Kill, my special one. <laughs> Zeyada with If Looks Could Kill. Very early, Muda Zeyada keeps Mexico Amigos in the race. Uh, it's my second year with him, actually. And, uh, well, took him all the way from the 130 classes all the way up to uh, the GCT levels. He's been doing a great job. Was already placed last year in the final in Riyadh and uh, already did a great job starting of the season with the Mexico Amigos. He's a very special guy. He, like, you cannot really, cannot really just barge in his property without asking. You know, you have to really introduce yourself and you have to ask him to get in and he has to allow it. Uh, otherwise, there's no, uh, there's no communication going to happen. So uh, he has to allow it, he has to accept you as a person, he has to feel complete trust, and then you can do everything what you want with him. I mean, I, back home, I do everything to him myself. No one really touches him except me. I do it from A to Z, uh, fully with him. He knows he's special now, and he's, um, he, he's developing this attitude of, a, of an important horse. So I think he's kind of getting advantage of this as well. Miami is a, is a special surrounding, it's a special venue, it's an amazing venue. It's his first time being there by the beach and he was so excited. He's also uh, very anxious with everything around him. and uh, He has to trust the venue pretty much. That was not enough time for that. He's so special, I promise you, he was not going to even touch a fence uh, in Miami. But after the, uh, after the injury, he was jumping completely on his own. He, he, he just knows what to do now. He really knows what to do now. I jumped him yesterday, 145 class. I was a little bit too excited. I wish I can jump him the two rounds of the team, but I will not be able to do that. And hopefully, if I'm still intact, I can do the Grand Prix if I qualify. Is from. <laughs> I think he's the horse of my lifetime. I mean, uh, out of out of eight Grand Prix, he was six times clear. I mean, uh, I think he's just uh, he's just right about to peak now. Mid-season, end of the year, I think this guy is gonna just barge in one one of those GCT rings and just grab it out and and go home with a win. The horse of his lifetime is the description from Muda Ziyaba on Oath If Looks Could Kill. As we said, three out of four clears already in 2024 in Global Champions League. Can he now add yet another as he comes in for the Mexico Amigos in the second round? As you can see behind me, the ring is still very, very busy. The main exhibition has ended, but now the official course walk is underway, but there's still a lot of action happening. That means that Rosie Tapner is back inside the ring for us, and she's standing by alongside one of the Cannes stars who are looking to increase their overall championship tally. Rosie, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I can tell you it was a different course walk for sure for these riders with that amazing exhibition going along there. Natalie Dean alongside me, four can stars powered by Iron Dames. You're coming in for Sané then into this round. How are you feeling ahead of this? I think we're feeling good. Uh, we had an unlucky one down in the last round, but I think there's only two teams on clears and a lot can change. We've seen you jumping so beautifully this season, but not quite a clear. You've been so close all the way, though. Do you think this is the day that you can make it? I think so. Um, I'm using my, my top horse, Akata M, today, and uh, it's her first time for the team, and I think she's going to do a great job. How suited is she to this type of arena? She's amazing. I jumped her in Auckland last year. She's jumped in big grass fields, and uh, honestly, she's amazing wherever she goes. You're an under-25 rider, and I've been seeing you getting lots of advice from Bayern Mayer walking this course today. What has he told you? I think he really told me to stick to my plan. Um, we know what we're doing with the horse. Um, we know the plan for her, and 
Um, it's just ride the plan and <laughs> here we go. Are there any particular lines of this course that you're most worried about? I don't think so. I, honestly, Annie, she's really competitive and she's more experienced this year than she was last year and I feel really confident on her. The Can Stars are doing so brilliantly throughout the season. I know we're only stage three, but you are joint top at the moment. Can you can, can continue that lead? That's the plan. <laughs> Very good luck. Thank you. Back to you, Mark, in the studio. Thank you very much, Rosie. Thank you very much, Natalie Dean. The Cun Stars, powered by the Iron Daves. What a revamp that this has been for the team throughout this season. They are looking superb and once again in the hunt for a podium finish as they find themselves third last to go. Speaking of third last to go, last to go, first to go, let's remind you of the rankings from Global Champions League Round 1 because that will give you a better idea as to how then the teams are going to come out. This is how it ended at the end of Global Champions League Round 1. As we said, of course, Prague Lions, powered by the Czech equestrian team, have been in sensational form. They finished on top of everybody else. They were the team to catch. Prague Lions, Rome Gladiators, the only two on double clear, and the Cannes Stars on four, the best of the fours. Falconswart United, as we said, very good with young Jack Ryan and Gilles Thomas. And as far as Falconswart United are concerned, many people then expecting Edwina Tops Alexander to then make their way back into the team. And that is not the case. The two young men have been given a real show of faith from Jan Tops as both Jack Ryan and Gilles Thomas will continue to jump for Falcons White United for the second round. We are moments away from the start of the second round of GCL. Stay with us here on GCTV. Get your live pass ready and gouge every single moment of the second round as we get ready to crown champions of Mexico City for 2024. Stay with us. GCL round two is next.